Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co hosts. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because... The more, the merrier. All right, friends, we've got an exciting announcement for today. Before we get into the episode, we've got an All-Valley team tournament with Dakota coming up. Yeah, one of our our first sponsor, really, for the show. You know, we made our first Just Another Kill Team gauges for a handful of listeners and some people who picked up merch. He's running the largest U.S. team tournament this year for the third time in a row and he's offered us two patreon subscriptions for you know people who are not on our patreon right now if you want to just sign up in our discord and hit us up and let us know that you want to be entered in the raffle drawing dakota will help you get into our patreon and get into our weekly stat show and how exactly do you get into that raffle drawing gotta join our discord and say compendium orcs we've got a date on it it is 9 21 and 9 22 Earth, Wind, and Fire style, the 21st night of September. That's how you can remember. And here's the episode. And so this is uh, Liam from Australia. We met the World Championships. We're, we're recording, I assume, Jason. Yes, we are. Welcome. <laughs> We've been doing uh, different different ways of getting into the conversations as of late. But Liam, welcome welcome to the, the podcast. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. I really wanted to like take the time to visit Australia again. We've, you know, we've had bands on, we've had Jay the Sloth on, we've had Alexa on, and now, right now, you're a worldwide number two, if I remember correctly, on That's ITC. It. Absolutely, yeah, cl- slowly climbing the leaderboards. I think it was like three points under Orion before this uh, previous tournament, but mm-hmm. uh, with the win in Brisbane, I have, uh, I jumped, uh, leapfrogged him to the number two. How's it feel to uh, put Australia? Back in the back in the driver's seat, part of the conversation, you're going out to the World Team Championship later this year. And now, you know, my work with the WTC to like help build the terrain is kind of like out and about on the Internet. So I can talk about it a little bit. <laughs> yeah, man. I know Alexa has been doing some of the similar work, so I'm sure you've been yep. looking at the terrain. And you've given a little bit of feedback to Alexa here and there. Yeah, Are you excited we- to play on that terrain in August? Absolutely. It looks really cool. Um, I've touched base with like Alexa would like just like pigeon like little bits to me um and i'll be like oh that looks really neat um it's always like a lot of stuff was just like work in progress so i didn't like i didn't commit a huge amount of my thought to it because i'm like as soon as i do i know that it will completely change yep um i said my brain is jinxed but yeah yeah um, actually absolutely for, looking forward to WT for anyone game. who's like curious i actually put an art like a some of the original terrain in my Goonhammer article since I've been working with Bandua since January. So I've had bits and pieces of the terrain kind of floating about in my local scene just so that people can give it a try and we can get feedback. And the terrain that's for sale right now, I think, looks really cool, actually. And it's yeah, got windows. It's that, like, it's that nice like middle ground between Octarius's like, uh, like interesting geometry and still being like not like silly cluttered like pipes that you're you're tucking a toe behind um yeah I yeah mean, i like, think it, it replaces the uh the the oil rig with a couple of walls that are kind of like into the mm. dark vibes for that open thing which is pretty cool and um and then also like with the mdf terrain normally has those like flush walls that you can't really um like you know get like it, it's very like you're in cover you're not but it, this one has these little buttresses that kind of like add a little more like dynamics to those flat walls which is pretty cool all in all i'm a big fan of this train yeah just more nuanced in general um than like yeah. just standard mdf um and with those walls i'm really interested to play on them uh, a big thing about where a uh, chalnath it's not a set you see in competitive very much but it gives me that vibe of like those those movement lane walls uh end up once you start adding doors to octarius it becomes a very open movement wise like you 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 don't have to commit to sides like you do in itd or in like with those more restricted movement lanes with those uh, solid walls yeah i think the windows 
are a big plus for me because I think over time Octarius has become a little stale as far as visibility goes because you're either fully visible or not visible at all just because players are now you know you if you're playing a melee team there's no reason to be visible ever right so you just hide perfectly but now with windows kind of everywhere as melee teams move around there's more ways that you can get clipped or if you're trying to fully avoid visibility there's less places where you can do it so it just kind of corrals the melee teams to have to make more interesting choices than just pile up behind a door yeah it gives interesting avenues to ignore obscuring as well something to consider um, when you have like Octarius walls, it's very much like I'm either non-reciprocally shooting or I'm just not visible. Um, whereas with windows, you can uh, enable a lot more dynamics with like setting gunners behind those walls, um, giving them ignore obscuring. And, uh, or yeah, even just right. like having a gunner run up to a window, catching a line of sight and being able to do the within two inch shooting at different totally. lanes just gives you more more room to play, I think, which I think is nice without it just being more doors. <laughs> Oh my god. I'm I'm sick of melee doors. I yeah, I'm very bored of all right, well I have a three Felgor behind this door. One of them's <laughs> gonna throw a tox horn bomb and we'll wait for you to interact with that. And then once you've gone out, the other two are gonna come, blood sense, <laughs> and just like split up. You're like, oh great, cool. We've done it, you've done it, you've broken the door. Yep. Punch you with or, a crack uh, grenade. Like I've got this important operative on one side of the door, and you've got a goon on. You've got your vet guard, one of four goons on the other, and now we've stalemated completely. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. How has the Australian scene been growing? You know, we had Jay on here a little bit ago, mm. and there was a, a tournament. I don't actually know how it ended up going or if it's happened yet. I think it was. Yeah, yeah, Did yeah. So uh, Jay, Jay was setting up the Northern Beaches uh, Grand Tournament, which oh, went, okay, right. uh, swimmingly. Uh, super fun. It was a mix of ITD and BD, um, which we're actually seeing recently has been a bit of a theme in Australia currently. Okay. Um, uh, I brought Hunter Clade, uh, but we had like a good turnout there. Um, Alexa tried out Pathfinders, which was uh, terrifying on BD. Uh, and uh, we had Sam Clark, uh, Samwise the Brave on the Discords. Uh, he was uh, running higher attack. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was, it was it was a really fun event. It was uh, six rounds over two days. Um, nice. How is Australia enjoying Beta Decima? I know a lot of the other scenes, especially the US, are not very high on Beta Decima, but it does sound like GW has been pushing that, like, oh yeah, we should be playing more Beta Decima if we could get any copies of the terrain. But Australia has <laughs> been playing it a little bit more. You know, tell us tell us and the listeners a little bit more about your experiences on Beta Decima. I, of yeah. course, figure that when you played Pathfinders on Beta Decima, it was not not the most fun experience. Mm, yeah, I managed to dodge Alexa's Pathfinders that time uh, after a, I think he had a draw against Sam with Hyrotech, uh, which was absolutely fine by me. They can uh, they can drag each other down um, on, on that terrain uh, with those teams. But uh, yeah, Beta Decima, we really leaned into it when it came out. Um, it was the sort of thought process of Look, ITD became such a core part of Kill Team that you may as well, one way or another, this terrain set's probably going to be used. Um, just from, like, it's available, tournament organizers are going to put it on the tables. Um, and it's 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 refreshing. It's a fun way of thinking, especially with the change from... Look, when it was, ignore obsc when it was obscuring on the gantries and the restricted line of sight, it was not a pleasant play experience. Um, now, I think certain teams... Uh, it, it it like narrows the playing field a lot more compared to like oh you're playing Phobos I can't win anymore, um, so uh, definitely more to think about now. Uh, it plays almost like ITD um, in that there's like it's you have to think positionally at the start, which I think is very healthy for kill team as a whole. Um, it's definitely like a you have to set your operatives up and know where they're going for the first couple of turning points because there's there's not a lot of broom to uh to switch up. Um, which is interesting. Uh, the Brisbane tournament we just had, uh, the TO there uh, used the uh, non-standard uh, beta decima maps. Uh, I'll, I'll mm. shoot them over to you at some point. Uh, but they were really fun to uh, to try out, and there's definitely room for innovation there, I think. Um, but yeah, different, different thoughts, uh, different advantages for different teams, which is nice to see. Um, climbing, like, look, free traverse, free climb is... It's just exceptional. Um, 
Kroot come to mind as like a Kroot, team that's just uh, like, yeah, this is great. Every climb, drop, and uh, yeah, like <laughs> optimized gate on Hunter not. Clade. Yeah, so I've been, I have been the the Hunter Clade came off the shelf when Beta Decima was a thing, especially with these recent tournaments that have been BD and ITD. Uh, oh, because yeah, that's nice. They love, they love optimized gate is incredible on BD. Um, you can threaten the entirety of the furnace from below it, um, which is fantastic. Uh, and they also love uh, opening a door, charging and fighting for free on ITD. So they they feel very at home at both of those. Um, but I think it's definitely given me an edge. Uh, I think that Hunter Clade's bad matchups have, all, have also taken a little bit of a hit over time too, right? Commandos were definitely one of the teams I didn't super love playing against before. Like, it was manageable, but just having them get taken down a notch and you know we have power swords if you play hunter clade it is nice Absolutely. to be able to actually kill a commando when you charge in melee right yeah um command they they do well into uh, like they don't do terribly into commandos anymore um they don't do terribly into uh felgors um they do i've i've i had a i had an absolutely brutal game into felgors um combining uh power weapons injury auras and no rerolls from the infiltrators uh, the no rerolls is is bullying. Um, if the, all the Felgor specialists are like threes relentless, uh, fours relentless, yeah. and there was there was circumstances where it goes to like five no rerolls, and that's a uh, that's not a situation Felgor want to be in. Uh, then it also, it's tough. Uh, they they used to really not like Harlequins as Hunter Clade. Um, Kisses will just open you up. They'll kill infiltrators and brush stalkers in a crit and a hit. And they'll kill everyone else in a crit, um, and that felt really bad. Uh, yeah, so I think a lot of their really terrible matchups have uh, improved. They're also a very honest team. Um, they don't have indirect. They don't have blast. So uh, with horde teams like like vet guard being toned down a bit, um, they've got more play space there as well. Yeah, I personally think that hunter clade are in a pretty good spot. I always thought that they had the tools to at least play. But now that all of the bad matchups have been trimmed down a little bit, it seems like they're in a good spot and their rerolls are more consistent. But you're right. They're a pretty honest team. When you look at something like Felgor, who get two lives, Hunter Clay is like, well, we hit on threes and we reroll once in everything. Yeah. And it's like, that's, yeah. that's got to be good enough when you can GA2 once or twice, right? Yeah, the, the GA2 is huge. It's really about picking your battles with Hunter Clay. Like, when, when do you send out a Rustalker to double fight? Um, when are you like. Uh, giving your leader that extra APL so he can GA himself and someone else to uh, to really ruin someone's day. Um, and when are you just sitting back and using like gunners with two rerolls on threes? Um, they're just flexible. They're they're a, an honest team, but they can they never feel out of place in a matchup um, anymore. They just feel like they have the tools. You've got a free mission action you can put somewhere. You have got a free pickup you can put somewhere. You've got a forward deploy. Um, you've got a D three heal. They've got these little bits that just make they never feel uncomfortable, uh, which is very nice. They're definitely why yeah. like one of the draws to playing them. I mean, that first World Championships, I had a lot of fun playing Hunter Clay just because it was kind of smooth sailing. I do wish that the Arquebus was allowed back in somewhere just because it's like not playable right now. I don't. Maybe that's just not. That's just my experience. How, have you been finding any use for the the third gunner that got axed like no, a year the, ago? Uh, the surfboard stays at home. Uh, unfortunately, it is nice that I don't have to fit him in my case anymore. But uh, <laughs> it is—it's disappointing. I can't uh, very clearly explain the rules of obscuring to someone via this uh, this uh, stupid oval base. Uh, They—I'd I'd like to see them get. If you brought four Sicarians, you'd get that extra gunner again. Yeah. Um, I think that would be good. Because uh, he's still not even like a must take. Then it's just in like those elite matchups or like against like Gelapox or something where you really need to push damage. That extra goon isn't very helpful, um, mm -hmm. and you can't really throw Sicarians at Gelapox. They will just kind of like put their hand out in front and hold them back. Yep, uh, I did watch that at the World Championships. We had aces, three Sicari or like two Sicarians and two Skatari just get mulched by a single Hulk, and that was the game. <laughs> yep, they'll do that. Yeah, you gotta shoot first. And I think the Arquebus just did not roll that well in that game, too. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like kind of yeah. a disaster across the board. But I think the Hunter Clader is super fun. And just being able to do a little bit of everything means that when you get good at the game, or you know all the teams, because you've 
played a bunch of teams at this point. Australia's got a pretty deep meta as far as player player depth goes. Yeah, you know, really. being able to know how to play your strong suit against your opponent's weak suit, and when you have all the suits, lets you kind of play the matchups as you want, right? Like when you go into vet guard, you just take a bunch of swords, you send them <laughs> into the midlines, you break it, break up the the midline with a bunch of double fight, and then you have your gunners pick off the guys in the middle, right? That's it. Um, yeah, it it definitely feels really rewarding. Um, because your game, you're, you can tailor into your opponent more so than than most teams. They they feel like one of the few teams that still uses the uh, roster system. Yes, uh, it's like every every matchup I will s- probably select something slightly different, which is which is really nice. Yeah, um, and there actually and, are some roster restrictions for Hunter Clay because oh you man, can't take yeah. every single Sicarian. You you're just not allowed to. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm 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 leaning towards dropping blades now. Uh, mostly because my Sicarians refuse to roll sixes, um, but uh, the double when you need it. Look, they're th- five attacks on threes, but when you when you roll bad and you need the double balanced and it's not there, uh, it feels it feels bad. Uh, I'd much rather the consistency of four five double balanced than a four six rending. Um, but yeah, you can't take everything. Uh, you can definitely figure out. It's definitely like. I've been leaning to more towards like all Vanguard, um, which definitely frees up some roster space. Uh, you don't get the tech of the double infiltrate with your gunners, um, but that comes from Rangers. I, it comes from Rangers, but I find Hunter Clade is so good at setting up for a TP two Alpha Strike that you don't need TP. You don't need to be particularly aggressive TP one. Um, I think TP one is is much more relevant for staging. Uh, and then just setting up setting up safe spaces for your rust stalkers to one way charge uh, than it is to like punish your opponent because you have a couple of extra flips. Yeah, if that's coming from the pursuers tactical ploy, which basically means that you can have two up to two rangers or vanguards get either an infiltrate or a recon option, right? So it's only rangers. Or it's only rangers. That's the, okay. So that's the the advantage of rangers because they don't get the injury aura that Vanguard get, which Oh my god, it's critical so many it's come up so many times. It is Yeah, because when you're GA two, you can basically chuck an injury aura to mm-hmm. support your combat combat monster. Yeah. And and even just like you'll be in uh the imperative to get a reroll in melee for your Rust Stalkers. And you'll have some someone like charge to tie up a goon. And he's now fours with a reroll. And he makes the enemy probably fours or fives, depending on what they are. And and there are just times where he'll just kind of karate chop his way out of there. Um. Yeah, that's that's with the leader's control edict, which I think at this point everyone is on board with just never taking the princeps outside of a handful of maybe loot missions, right? Yeah, I could see maybe like loot ITD um, and you're taking... uh, a plant transponder uh but outside of that uh i i wish it was more relevant to take a, a sicarian but it also leaves you with an extra like vanguard uh just probably like mook who's not particularly exciting um comparatively to having a, a random sicar like rust stalker uh, I, it, the mm-hmm. rust stalker assassin is kind of fun sorry the princeps um mm-hmm. Because he goes to eleven wounds, uh, and he he will just like murder things in melee at eleven wounds. That's so it's a it's a nice breakpoint uh, with like rending balanced four six. But uh, I think outside of a, a funny uh, time to make him a melee blender, uh, it's not particularly competitive. I think it's really that roster slot that makes it extremely not competitive. Because you really yeah. do. I don't know. Back in the day when we had some more options for Skatari gunners, it did feel a little bit tighter. Now without the Archibus, it does free up two slots, so you yep. can kind of take most of your toys, but you're still restricted just a little bit. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Um, the other one to think about is what the ranged weapons your infiltrators are going to have. Um, for the most part, I've been taking the stub carbine just to ex- expose a bit more threat. So it's basically a ceaseless bolt gun, mm-hmm. um, and. Uh, because I'm not expecting a lot of damage, but when you've got the the shoot imperative for a, an extra reroll, uh, ceaseless with balanced is uh, is consistent at the very least. Ceaseless with balance is pretty good. So against like five wo- or seven wound five up save teams, just having the extra consistency means that you can have a whole team that can just go toe to toe. And if you can kill the medic, then you can go toe to toe with 
really efficient stats, right? Because when you think about what other shooting teams are doing, they're not hitting you on threes base. They're hitting you on fours with a bunch of rerolls, or they're doing it with dice fixing mechanics. It's not generally just raw stats. That's normally reserved for the Marines. Yeah, totally. Uh, the other thing that Admech has is they you can you can bulk up like you can group up near your leader for the group activate, and you certainly should do that. Um, but your gunners themselves are pretty um, independent. They don't need a huge amount of support to do well. Um, you probably want them near an objective for a, a reroll. And other than that, uh, it's not like there's not a lot of conditional uh, like rerolls to to restrict their movement. Uh, and they don't need like a spotter near them or anything. You can you can move your as long as you're ignore obscuring guys within nine. You can really get him where he needs to be. Um, and then out of that, outside of that, they're just threes with a couple of rerolls most of the time. Is very good. Yeah, we've we've chatted a lot about like how many options there are. I'm curious if there like if there's anything that is like 100% always auto take this, or is it pretty much always flex choices? And like, is there anything that a new player should be aware of that is like totally a trap? Yeah, I think at the moment the Arcubus is definitely a tra trap in your gunner options. I'd, I'd leave him on the shelf. Um, he's just too unwieldy, pun intended. Uh, and uh, the uh, must takes I would I wouldn't leave home without at least three rust stalkers and they all cost one EP to put in your list because they are taking optimized gate every single time uh, a, f a free two inches for your first drop climb or traverse uh, coupled with a strat to give them plus one movement makes them absolute killers they uh, they will out threat most melee operatives and they will blend them if they get the charge yeah so those uh, guys. Um, they only have power weapons and no shooting at all, and they can double fight, and that's the difference between the Rust Stalkers and the um, Infiltrators? Yeah, so they've got five attacks instead of the four on the Infiltrators, and their weapons are uh, effectively a balanced chainsword, um, which is more than enough to, to make up uh, the difference against a melee, like another melee operative, especially considering their ten wounds. Yeah, yeah they come in at a really nice ten wound breakpoint, which means that against... Most specialists, if you have four or five balanced, double balanced often because you have the mm -hmm. Doctrine on, as long as you go first, you end up with four or five hits to your opponent's three-ish hits. Maybe on two hits. On a good hits. day, yeah, two, two hits. Yeah, exactly. Like, if you're going against a four, four attack operative, they're landing anywhere from two to three. You're landing anywhere from four, four-ish is generally what you're getting if you have two rerolls, four attacks on threes. And if you're taking the rending option, which you know technically is good when you have yes. two rerolls you are doing six damage a hit which can be really really hard for anyone to really handle yeah yeah it'll, it'll mess up marines um i found the double balance is incredibly good against like uh higher attack uh because they're all their operatives hit on threes so they don't do a lot of damage but they will parry you out um but you have five hits you kill them guaranteed doesn't matter what their outcome is um which is very very nice uh, the other thing the Rust Stalkers get is the, the double fight strat uh, for a turning point, and a uh, fight once for free. Uh, I found, of the recent tournament I played, I use the fight once for free every time. I use the double fight very rarely. Um, being able to loot, charge, fight for free, or open a door, charge, fight for free. I had a Rust Stalker with a free mission action uh, with the Servo Skull equipment. He can uh, open a door for free, move dash, hatchway fight for free uh which is pretty ludicrous while ignoring a barricade while ignoring your barricade you're forgetting you're forgetting that you're forgetting uh, that you an actually extra, added another one in two inches on top of what yeah, your opponent so was thinking swift. like oh can he do it can he not do it you're like yeah. i will be there yeah he's a little yesterday. he's a little knife-handed cruise missile uh, and i love him yeah so and you get five of them yeah, you so, can well, so you there you always take at least three you can have up to five S yep. So there's there's some flex choices there. Yeah, so the I'd sacrifice uh I'd I'd usually take at least one infiltrator, which drops your Rust Stalkers down to five uh four to four or three. Um the infiltrator gets a forward deploy. Uh he's uh just good to to push some threat in a really good position turn two. Um and uh yeah, he's he's incredibly flexible. He epitomizes this team where he's got good melee, good shooting. Um, and decently durable, uh, 
and then into some matchups where the teams really rely on rerolls, like Pathfinders or Felgors. Um, I'd consider an extra Infiltrator just for the six inch aura of no rerolls they can pop uh, for a strat. Uh, it can it can basically shut down two lanes of a map uh, from consistent enemy shooting, which is pretty great. Yeah, and the turn off rerolls is is a strat play. Yeah, so it affects the whole turning point uh, yeah. on all your Infiltrators. Yeah, it's super duper yeah. solid. And for anyone who can't tell the difference between the Admec models, just look at the heads. That's where that's, that's where all of the modeling is done. Plus, the Rust Stalkers don't have guns. Yeah, and guys with knife hands, uh, they will kill you in melee. And the guy who looks like he's got the head of a pit droid from Star Wars, uh, he uh, he'll he'll do a little bit of both. Um, do and whatever he, he, got... he'll do whatever he wants. And then when it comes to the scut, uh, the Skatari, it's it's going to be uh, whether they have hoods or not, um, and that's that's basically it. Uh, I have a couple of models that aren't uh, that this event weren't modeled correctly, but it doesn't matter because no one can tell them apart. Um, that's true. Yeah. And uh, the and same problem as the Eldar guns. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. This is my blaster. Uh, and this is my shredder. Uh, don't look too closely. Um, the other thing, uh, word of warning if you're getting into Admech, uh, either invest in a very nice carry case or uh, be aware that none of your uh, antennas or Rust Orca swords will survive about two tournaments. Um, they will just as, fall apart. As a, as a Hunter Clay player in the past, I think every single model has had an antenna break off somewhere. I've tried repairing them, but you know there's really no guarantees and you're like one drop away from something just disappearing forever or like for admec players who play 40k i have nothing but infinite sympathy for <laughs> yeah uh the flesh is weak uh the plastic antennas are weaker so with hunter clay it feels like you know you're pretty happy with where the meta is right now do you feel like there are other teams that kind of sit where the hunter clade are that you're worried about who you can kind of push and pull in some of the directions i know that blooded have been doing i think particularly well as of late you know as another kind of team that can do both melee and shooting in equal measures with some good tricks have there been yeah, other teams but, that you've been looking at yeah so blooded definitely with the the flexibility there as well um as we see more especially as we see more um boards like different boards like bd itd and open uh so those teams that can do a little bit of everything start to shine more they, they get more consistent results at tournaments as well but um yeah blooded uh hunter clade i still think star striders are a, a are a scary team um they've they sit in that flexibility role they put a little bit more of their eggs in one basket um with their operatives um and i think Wormblade as well uh feel uh, similar i had an incredible game in brisbane uh, against a Wormblade player, um, and they they feel like they've got they've got tools now um, for sure. Um, they're they're a bit more they're a bit less like hemmed in by restrictions um, than they used to be, um, which I think is beneficial. Yeah, I think we were talking about Warp Coven earlier too as a team that's like oh, slowly they've been like unshackling them over time. But I don't know if anyone can tell if they're actually good or not. So uh, a friend of mine, Christine, uh, she is a, a lifelong uh, Shadow Wizard Money Gang warp cover player. Uh, absolutely uh, in deep. Uh, and with the new buffs, uh, she's been having a great time. Uh, they feel like, before it felt like Warp Coven had all these tricks, but they had to use them to gain parity. Now it feels like they've got a little bit more um, play to... Uh, use the tricks to get the advantage, um, which is spooky. Uh, I don't think they're quite there yet. Uh, I think it still just hinges on those sorcerers doing just about everything. Uh, although Zangors you do get uh, will just pop off sometimes now with nine wounds. Uh, they'll kill guys with chainswords, and sometimes the relentless will just just work. <laughs> Sometimes four dice on fours, four or five relentless does land like two crits, two hits, and you're like, oh, this is gonna be a fun one. Yeah, I, I had I had a couple of rough stalkers absolutely ruined at the uh, last event. I charged them into a Zangor who rolled effectively a Yahtzee, um, and I just looked at my I looked at my four hits and went, none of these are crits. I guess he's dying. <laughs> yeah, 
that is the danger of the the nine wound, like the past eight wounds right once you're past yeah. eight yeah. wounds you need to be able to do a five damage hit somewhere and not every, <laughs> like if you if you just get four hits which is normally a good result and your opponent yeah. hits the crits you're like ah oh, crap i can't kill this guy in two hits i'm gonna eat yeah. i'm gonna eat it <laughs> i think yeah. this okay. actually just happened to me today i was playing higher tech against or i was playing intercession against higher tech i charged mm -hmm. into an immortal he rolled two crits two hits and i rolled three hits and i was like oh this is not good for me <laughs> yeah yeah totally you uh the the higher tech is surprisingly resilient to melee um if they can screen out their bugs from getting stabbed uh just everyone hitting on threes will just they'll just parry out melee operatives plus 10 wounds uh, and regenerating yeah it's crazy 100% yeah, this was, it was this kind of math that kind of like led me to my latest green skin thing, which has uh, been pretty amusing because like green skins, like you've got eight boys that have balanced choppas and then Wog gives you auto crits. <laughs> it's just like it's bananas and you have pre nerf just a scratch. You give up all of your like specialists and your tricks for just like just boys. Oh, no, no, but you've also got two rocket launchers and those are absurd. Like, uh, the rocket launcher, when you give it a the targeting squig, targeting thing, it needs. yeah, yeah, that's it. Sorry, uh, I played a compendium tournament against green skins on ITD, and those rocket launchers are like weapons of mass destruction. There, yeah, uh, DACA, 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 one. plus more DACA, and then like they can gain lethal five on into the dark, and then it's like if you exactly. get a single crit and fail, becomes a normal hit, and then all of a sudden <laughs> they've got like two crits and two hits, and you're like, what is going on? Or you're like, like they I'm whiff taking completely. Two mortal wounds. Yeah, I'm taking it's... two mortal wounds. It's AP one. It's four five damage. There's five dice there. I'm like, I'm just gonna. I'm. I just don't have enough dice to save. It has like a twenty percent uh, chance of doing zero, and then like a twenty percent chance of doing like <laughs> sixteen, and then but then like yeah. if you do zero, then you just more daca, and then you just one other sh shot to just <laughs> obliterate anything. It's ridiculous. It's a, they are, they yeah. are a, a total coin flip gun, but you got two of them, so you just need to flip the coin twice. Uh, you kill and something. more daca, so you flip the coin twice. <laughs> You've got three. You've got three ch chances in a turn. Just absolutely delete something. Someone will will, will evaporate. <laughs> Let's see. You just had a compendium tournament recently. Oh, that was uh, it was a few months ago actually. Okay. Um, there's been uh, one of the groups in Castle Hill has been running uh, monthly tournaments. Emma and Christine out there who are fantastic. Uh, it's been really good to push the community in these like these sort of entry level tournaments. Um, low commitment. Um, come play kill team, try it out. Give have an excuse for a deadline to paint those ten models that you got on your shelf. Um, Is that particular tournament you're talking about always only compendium, or just like it was recently? Uh, we had we, have, we had one one month that was a it was a compendium only, just to mix things up. Um, what was the uh, what was the top three? What are what are the best compendium cool. teams that uh, outside of like talons, I guess, and void dancers? Yeah, which yeah, yeah. I assume we're not allowed, <laughs> or at least void so dancers. I've so I brought uh, Talons, but all sisters. Okay, um, Whoa. Which, which was which was a good time. I like that. Um, I had like four four flamers, five swords, and a bolt gun, uh, just to have a, just have a, have fun with it. Um, but yeah, I think orcs and uh, elder elder popped off with yeah. uh, craft world. With actually, are pretty good as far as compendium yeah. go. Yeah, it's all it's all just ways. Companion boys boils down to ways to get three APL. Um, <laughs> there are so many missions in this game now that you realize, oh, I don't have a comms, and uh, I just can't get there. Like turn one, I just can't score a point on the midboard. Uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's too far away. Like that, uh, the diagonal, the diagonal board mission <laughs> where there are four on the midline. There's just nothing we can do. We're just gonna have to deal with it next turn. Yeah, just I'm gonna recon dash one. One sister and the rest are gonna just jog uh, for a while. I mean, Compendium Guard has Com City. Sure. It's like AT and T up in there. Alexa has been raving about uh, Compendium Guard being like a sleeper pick because of how many special weapons you can bring. This is when he just came off of his Cassican binge, so yep. it was just like, yep. how can I shoot sense. more? Um, and uh, Compendium Guard. Just uh, bring a mix Scions guard team and have uh, have two comms uh, and a whole bunch of special weapons. And the Scion comms. comms can comms twice. Yeah. yeah so you have you have six AP, six extra APL on a turn if you'd like. Yeah. Uh, and you on can turn have three two, plasma you get move, guns. Move, move, two two meltas, two plasmas. Three mission four, actions. Three rerolling <laughs> yeah. ones. 
Yeah. You know, moving an extra inch, and you're you suddenly a... like, well, let's go. Yeah, you're gonna <laughs> this have is a, the new meta. A, uh, you're gonna have a scion that has three APL and can do a free mission action. He's just like Scions on ITD level bonkers. Are legit. Uh, yes. In the, in the Dark Scions are quite good, actually. So, like, Compendium Guard are very, very good. They do require you to think fully a turn in advance, because you are putting comms buff <laughs> for the next turn. Like, you cannot just be like, I'm just going to put a comms buff and here and use it. You're like, did you really want to do that? Or could you like, have done that next turn? Yeah, and it's, like, surprisingly hard to score attack ops with them. That's, like, the one thing that holds them back for me. Yeah, attack ops, and uh, if, there's, if there's melee on the other team, you have to respect it so hard. Yeah. Uh, there's no like, there's no like, um, clear the line from vet guard that just yeah. makes them infuriating. Maybe to try that's and kill part of my problem sometimes. too, because someone like the people I, I did like, I've done like I don't know, thirty games with Compendium Guard, and I just like <laughs> blitz out there and blast people in the face and then die, and I'm like, that was fun, and then I lose. Yeah, yeah, you want to run it back? Yeah, you can re rack very quick. Yeah, yeah, we had a guy locally who played Compendium Guard for a lot actually, because they are surprisingly good. They've got good bra stats, and as long as you're ceaseless holds they will way overperform what it, they look like yeah yeah or well, scions with ceaseless are, are, are brutal they will they will kill they got that consistency there um but they they feel sometimes more consistent than Cassigan, uh which is funny it is yeah. funny yeah but they don't have nearly as good of the specialists right you lose the medic you lose the obscuring ignoral you yeah. igno like you lose you lose some tools you lose but you gain sniper. just like raw the sniper raw the sniper is such a such a key operative for uh, like holding on to the tempo um having a silent operative so I, I wish i had a silent operative in hunter clade um they after playing was... a huge amount of novitiates um, that was our uh, that was our unwieldy Archibus for the long time. That was, that was it. He was that was that was our version of a silent gun, and they took it away from yeah, us. That's it. They they took look they they massacred my boy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they um after playing a lot of novitiates, I I'd been uh, holding on to the the crutch that is my my silent crossbow. <laughs> um, oh, that God, I, can I hate that model crits. so much. Uh, I have like a seething hatred for it. the cup girl <laughs> and the and the stupid crossbow. Oh. Uh, the, you know, Fortis is... on twos, plasma, infinite range. I, I sleep. It's fine. It's gonna kill someone. The cross, yeah, it's always gonna kill someone. But the crossbow. Oh god, I hate it so much. It's so funny explaining to someone the profile of the crossbow after they've played a couple of games of novitiates because they just you shoot them and they die, but no one actually realizes it's only two three damage. They just <laughs> they 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 don't conceive that it's only two three damage P one. It's just because it's always got like a two crits there and maybe relentless. Yeah, um, and, and it's like it does mortal wounds. It's like mortal wounds two. Also, is it mortal wounds two? Basically, yeah, it's two exactly. five. It's two five. It's, two, it's, it's really two what five. it is. Yeah, it's two, two five with say... uh, with our guaranteed crit and, and AP one. P one. Yeah. yeah. But yes, it does just like point at something. It's like oh, I'll just remove that and I'll just sit here and I'll just yeah. do this every turn. You're like oh my god, I hate this it's model totally. so much. It's so it it felt. It felt good from from going from Novitiates to Hunterclade because they're both very consistent teams with a mm -hmm. bit of flexibility. They just do it differently. Um, yeah, I think Novitiates, you have to be way more surgical just because on seven wounds, you really don't have as much room for mistakes. Totally. But you get the benefit of actually guaranteed dice. It's similar to how mm -hmm. Caster can kind of get away with games where you're like, all right, I'm going to go do this. <laughs> I need this to happen. It's going to happen. You're like, cool, I will die now. <laughs> Yeah, I think that is what upped my Hunter Clade game coming back to them. Because they were the first team I, I picked up starting Kill Team. I played them for about six, seven months. Um, big proponent of, like, when you get into Kill Team, if you find a team you like, just stick to them and learn Kill Team. Um, but For anyone going... who doesn't know Liam, Liam has uh, a ranger as his icon on Discord. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, very yeah. into the AdMech vibes. Yeah, I think my background on BCP is is like some of Kiddo Paint's art. He's a fantastic uh, artist in the Admet community. Very cute little little Skatari. But yeah, uh, going from Novitiates uh, and having to be so surgical positionally um, because you can't you can't have people get touched in melee. You can't have people run up and shoot you. Um, and then going back to Hunter Clade, which is which has a bit more leeway there, but while still retaining that knowledge of how to how to position well. Uh, definitely up your game. So yeah, uh, some of these like more unforgiving teams uh, will just make it easier when you go back to teams that that have a bit more flexibility. Yeah, I think that's actually a really good point. I always like to back in the day. I like to ask people like, you know, 
what did you carry over from team to team? So it sounds like because novitiates are basically made of paper, you learn to position more cagely in the correct spots and stage correctly. And because Hunter Clay, you get GA2, if you stage correctly, suddenly your best melee operative has an injury bubble on it and then a an angry whirring boy pops out of a corner and just blitzes you. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um absolutely the case. I get uh God, uh novitiates as well. You've got these these missiles to to every operative has to do their thing. Um your like penitent has to go out and kill and then throw a crack grenade. Your flamers have to go out and and be uh, war criminals with that two, uh, three four flamer. Um, these things like have to happen, and so you kind of see where they're going to be at the start of the game and like TP three. Um, that you can you can utilize that on basically every team. It's less uh, noticeable and it's less like um, overt, but I can set a rough stalker up and I I know where he's going to be or what I want to get out of him. And that's a big thing, I think, in getting better at kill team is knowing what you want to get out of each operative you place on the board. Yeah, I think that is an excellent point because it's not just about scoring points. It's about setting up operatives to get ready to score points and making sure that if this guy dies, he has done his job because he might not have gotten the point. But if his job was to go chuck a grenade into a pile of three people and kill two of them, that's good enough too. As long as that is part of the game plan, it can't just be random moves, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah you want and your, I think... your you want your overarching play to be um, like consistent. You 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 can have like little like spontaneous decisions that are better, um, but you don't want to be like changing the. You don't want to have to reanalyze the game state every activation. Yeah, I think the finding the strategic level of thought is actually the thing in Kill Team that a lot of people, I think, miss. They see the, the trees and not the forest. Considering that Jason is over here at LVO this year, he's just like, oh yeah, we're just going to play Doom Guy and five Assault Intercessors and just <laughs> casually walk through the tournament with a 5-2-2 two, and two record. And we're like, and that's like purely a strategic level decision. He saw the Doom Guy at work locally and he's like, if I can just go rustle some jimmies early on and get people to go attack these five guys i can just nuke people from afar so those and that's like a strategic thing it's not really a, as much of a tactical decision mm, especially yeah, when yeah. five dudes start on engage and end up in your opponent's midline on turn yeah. one and like it does make the tactical stuff like easier because then it's just like um it, you know it, it, it's like the doom guy is the only one that you need to be like careful with and then everyone else just needs to recklessly steal points and and mm. so then it's it's way easier to like think on your toes if you only have to pay attention to one model. That's like one archetype of of a way that I like to think about that kind of stuff. Totally. Uh, you also have that once you have that overarching plan, you can identify a a good play, a good activation from if it falls into that plan, not just if it is the best activation on the table. Um, so it, it it frees up a bit of headspace there as well. Yeah. And, you know, you have Alexa on the side, you know, it seems like he's swapping teams a lot right now, huh? Yeah, he's uh, he's jumping around. I think after Worlds, he was he was just interested in upping his game overall. He got into game, I think it was game two against Orion uh, and was like, I have not played enough Galapox to know this matchup. And that game was was very ended in a draw. Uh, Incredible game. But. Uh, I think he's looking to just expand his horizons on Kill Team. Um, he has the core knowledge down. It's just knowing the minutiae of every team. So he's been he's been getting around, uh, playing on TTS, playing uh, playing different teams. Uh, definitely beneficial to your Kill Team experience. Always useful to play new things just so you can get a feel for what things are allowed. Because I think a lot of people are always worried about the what they don't know but if you kind of have played three or four different archetypes of teams at least you kind of understand what like a melee sneaky team will do once you've played a little bit of phobos or a little bit of blooded right like you kind of get a sense for some of the ideas that the the kill team designers have put into the game yeah you can use those principles on like an archetype of team on all those archetypes um kill teams are very much about how well you know your team but also how well you know your opponent's team uh, and you can only go get so far from asking them a couple of questions at the start of the game. 
have you found any teams particularly hard to grok or how have the two new complicated teams been in the australian meta i know that me and jason we do our you know our patreon show on mondays and we've seen that mandrakes and night or night lords have been a really huge part of the overall world meta how has it been in australia because these are very complicated teams as far as the rules blow goes mm, yeah for sure i've picked up uh night lords uh, nemesis claw uh, i think they are a fun team i don't think they still don't shore up the elite weakness um and they don't have the stats of intercession to like just like brute force their way in uh, but they have so many fun combos and fun abilities that they're a, a joy to play. I think the the problem is the Australian meta, for a while, I was bringing intercessors to uh, every tournament. So everyone got rather good at uh, killing six models uh, on the board. Uh, so it's a bit of a shark tank for elites at the moment. Uh, the uh, Mandrakes on the other side, I actually yet to play a game against them. Uh, they've gone under my radar... Look, I think they're good, but God, do they look unforgiving. Um, you have so little APL, and it all hinges on about three operatives. Uh, that sounds terrifying. Uh, but if you could make everything work to its fullest extent, they've got some, some pretty busted jank uh, from just reading their rules. I think the biggest thing for them is the four up with a free retain can end up feeling way better than it looks. And because everyone has a full range gun, you can just kind of get into shootouts with people while retaining one to two dice on an invuln, which can just make the shootouts really, really hard to actually deal with. And then once you cut a hole in someone, you can send a shadow portal or chooser into the lane and get some APL. It's kind of what it feels like people are doing right now. Yeah. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. And like uh, the, the leader with the Ubliex, I feel like... Oh Honestly, it kind of like boils down to this like horrible dice thing that like neither of you really have control over whether it like denies people activating and then when, when you do fight him and he has the like on a five up just to scratch and it's like completely unpredictable. You're just totally at the mercy of the dice. And I'm like, it's strong, but it's not like you can't just like make a choice. And it's like it's just super risky for both players. So I'm like. The more I've like looked at that and like seen it on the table, I'm like, oh man, that's another one of those just like you're really at the mercy of the dice. Yeah, these these abilities that are strong but not competitive. Um, it's kind of how I define yeah, it. Yeah, because of the dice. Uh, we had a we had a Mandrake mirror at the recent tournament, and I watched mm -hmm. them. Uh, I'd finished my game and I wandered over and I watched them activate uh, to both of their try and activate both of their leaders <laughs> within six of each other, and then both of them activated their. Um, the, the seeker guy, uh, because they were uh, linked to the leader activating. Uh, it was just an absurd <laughs> chain of events. It was like watching people play Uno reverses and skip turns in a game of Uno. Uh, that's what this Mandrake mirror boiled down to. And I'm glad they got to experience it and I didn't have to. Well, you got to experience it from afar, which is nice. That's it. I didn't have to experience the consequence, uh, which was perfect. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. How, so things in Australia have been going well. How many players are currently slated up to go to the World Championships for you guys? Okay, so we've got me. Oh, Alexa earned his spot uh, right for top so, eighting. Uh, yep. For top eighting. Just for top eight, I think. Uh, no, yeah. no other reason. Um, <laughs> at least, uh, at least the top eight, right? That's it. Uh, whereas I uh, won the first event in uh, the first grand tournament that we had that a band set up that went really well. Um, I won that with Novitiates and, and a golden ticket. And since then, we've had two other golden ticket events, uh, one in the Northern Beaches, uh, which Christine Holtzum has won uh, with her Warp Coven. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, we had this event in Brisbane, uh, which Taz, a guy from Brisbane, uh, who mm -hmm. played Wormblade uh, really well, actually, surprisingly surprisingly uh, tight play from him. Uh, so, And then Sam as well, oh my god, uh, second place at the Purge. Uh, nice. Or second golden ticket, sorry, uh, at the Purge, which, uh, which one in that. So Is I there a sense like, for how many five, more no. people are you, Australia looks like it's going to be sending? Because I know last year it was mm. a contingent of two of you guys right two of us yeah just the yeah. two of us um, and then christine was there but playing underworlds and now she's underworlds. 
Yeah. So a multi-discipline world champion, right? Yep. Uh, <laughs> Someone's and, gonna uh, have to try to make that uh make that actually an achievement. You know, you win forty k, like get to get in on forty k <laughs> AOS, everything else. Like that would actually be a pretty cool side yeah. achievement for people going yeah, to the world champs. God. Uh, yeah. So I think we've got one coming up in Melbourne uh, towards the later half of this year. Um, and I I don't know uh, other events wise, but GW has been really great with getting these tickets out. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if we see like a couple more golden tickets go out for Australia. It'd be good to see. It, it's good to have a uh, a full full house uh, coming over to the US for Atlanta. And it goes without saying that Australia is going out to the World Team Championship later this year. Is there any chance that you guys are thinking about going to Dakota's All Valley Team Tournament since? California oh. is not the craziest distance away from Australia. <laughs> I'm just curious because Dakota uh, Dakota is running, I think, the largest non non like GW team event. I, it might be one of the largest events, and it's coming up in September. So I think he just announced it. It'll this podcast will come out on time. Is there any golden tickets and everything? of uh, Australia sending some people over? Man, I I, I wish I was uh, I could justify a third overseas trip, uh, but. Uh, I think I might be kill teamed out with Worlds and the WTC, uh, but man, we've got uh, so many uh, good players and so many up and coming like competitive guys and and uh, women who have just like got the bug. They've just like caught this like kill team competitive bug. You see it. They'll come to a tournament and then before the tournament's finished, they'll ask, "Hey, is there another one coming up uh, anytime soon?" And you're like, "Yeah, they've got it. They're they're in." They're stuck here. So, look, it wouldn't surprise me if, if we got a team together between, like, New South Wales, Melbourne, Queensland. Uh, there's some guys in the ACT as well that are that are, are pulling their weight for sure. Um, but I, I, I couldn't say for certain, no. Yeah. All right. All right. Is there any, uh, any other teams that you want to talk about before we uh, split for the night? Oh, um, I'm... I'm pretty happy with uh with my with my roster of of hunter clade and novitiates uh they're they're both really fun teams and definitely recommend people to try them out uh they've also been untouched by so many data slates um like hunter clade got a quality of life improvement this slate but it really wasn't like a buff um particularly uh they're just good consistent kill teams and uh that's what i like to play uh but yeah uh yeah thanks, thanks so much for having me oh my God. Yeah, thanks for coming on. And thank you listeners for listening until the end. If you haven't already, you should leave us five-star reviews and subscribe and all that jazz. And uh, join the Discord and chat with us, and we'll see you there. <laughs>